<laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to the Human Animal Connection Show, where we believe we can communicate with all animals. Join us as we explore the 33 principles and healing methods of the human animal connection. As animal lovers, we know that you share our commitment to making the world a kinder place for all creatures. Together, let's embrace the transformative healing power of the human animal connection. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Human Animal Connection Show. I'm your most fortunate host, Michael Overly, and I'm with the ever present, ever amazing, and helpful Jeannie Joseph. <laughs> Thank you. Good Hi, to be Jeannie. with you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm super excited about this. We had such a good time on the last episode that leads right into this. And I'm I I, I can't wait. I can't wait. So t- yeah. tell us what we're doing. Well, we were just talking about the soul of an animal and connecting with the soul of an animal and how beneficial that is for us as humans and also for them. And when those people who choose to, if you want to connect with your animal who's passed on, that the door is open if you choose to communicate with them soul to soul. So that's what we we're talking about in our last episode. And in this episode, it's called Animals on Purpose. And in this episode, we're exploring the possibility of some animals are very happy just to be what I would call pets, you know, like they're perfectly content to just be a dog or just be a cat or just be a horse. Other animals have come in with some different purposes. And some of those purposes relate to healing, to teaching, to um, working with energy fields. I mean, all different kinds of purposes. And it's really exciting when you help an animal live out their purpose when you discover what an animal's purpose is like we do a lot of work with kids and high schools with the therapy dogs and about 20 percent of dogs are really interested in doing therapy dog work they really are aware of human emotions they really want to be present for human emotions they really want to comfort humans other dogs it's like nah no thanks (laughs) crazy humans i don't you know i'll play ball with you but you know you're nuts (laughs) that it's just uh, really interesting that you can't make a dog be a therapy dog that that isn't, you know, they'll never pass the test. And you can't not a a dog that's truly a therapy dog, you can't stop that dog from being a therapy dog. I mean, they will be a therapy dog wherever they are. You know what I mean? They will just tune in to humans and what they need and even physical illness without any training at all. So it's really exciting to, to consider the possibility that some dogs have a sense of purpose. So that's what we're exploring today. There's a dog ricochet, right? Ricochet. Ricochet, the surf dog. Right, the surf and, dog. And I actually connected with Ricochet's owner. This is a couple of oh. years ago. Was it oh. almost two years ago when I, I was putting on a summit and I wanted her to present? Oh. She was just too busy, but I had oh. the most amazing conversations with her. Yeah. And, she, and she shared so much. Um, anyway, t- tell me tell me all about Ricochet. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll tell the audience a story and then you can add in. Yeah. So um, Ricochet was born and bred to be a service dog. So she came from this lineage of, you know, bred for temperament for service dogs. So, you know, I mean, it couldn't everything right. And Judy Fredono was her trainer and had her since, I don't know, eight weeks or something very early puppyhood. And Ricochet was a puppy prodigy. I mean, like, Within a couple of months, she could do everything. She could practically balance a checkbook. She could open the laundry and take the clothes out. And she could pick up objects. And she knew all the commands and sit and down and stay and come and watch and you know all these things. She could do everything. And then when she hit adolescence, she went on strike. She wouldn't do anything. She wouldn't do any of the commands. She would start chasing birds. And this was after Judy had like, you know, videos of this puppy prodigy doing it. And I've seen those videos. It's amazing to see this little thing doing everything. <laughs> and she was like, all right, I got to give this dog away because her work is training service dogs. And this was not going to, this dog was not going to get through the testing process. And she was about to give him away and she, her away. And she had a little, I guess a baby pool in your backyard, a little surfboard and Ricochet, the dog got on the surfboard and loved it. And that gave her an idea. And so she began taking Ricochet to the ocean and putting her on a real surfboard. And to cut, to make the long story short, she 
began helping paralyzed children do tandem surfing. So Ricochet and the child strapped to, you know, together on this board would go surfing in the ocean. And this was children who'd never been in the ocean, you know, whatever, whatever the stories was. I mean, it was like the highlight of their life to go surfing with Ricochet. And she raised thousands and thousands of dollars in the videos to help with rehabilitation with children. And she did it for adults too. And she was a very happy camper and she was never going to pass the service dog test, but she was in surface, you know, in the surf doing her service. And it's a beautiful story because, you know, her trainer with all good intentions had thought she had one plan in life and what the, to her credit recognized that Ricochet had a different plan and it was much more beautiful because she helped many more people. A service dog is going to change the life for one person, which is a beautiful thing, but this dog changed the life of many people and gave many people hope. Yeah. Oh yeah. She, I know she had to change her, her business model and everything things that she was offering. Yeah. And, and Judy shared a story with me that I'll, she started working with ser, um, service members, right? Retired service yeah. members, veterans. Yeah. There was this time when um, this guy was just interested in, in meeting um, Ricochet and Ricochet just spent some quiet time with this guy and completely completely changed this man's outlook and perspective on his life. Wow. And she realized that her dog was actually a healer in this other way. Yes. Um, anyway, it was fantastic. And and she's gone on to help, you know, so many other people, not just the kids, but veterans too. Yeah. So it's fantastic. Yeah. I've seen that so many times, you know, the right dog with the right veteran and everything changes because the dog has no judgment. The dog has no shoulds, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, or you know, what you did wrong or anything like this. The dog is just like your essence. I love you. <laughs> yeah. What did you call it? The Tao principle? What did you say? The un... Oh, the irreducible essence. The irreducible essence. That's yeah. what the dogs... That's what dogs see. One of the reasons why it's so amazing to be with animals like that, those animals that are truly tuned in like that, is that, in fact, that's one of the gifts that they give us is that they see us for who we really are. Not just you know the uh, you know diplomas on our wall or the car we drive or what you know whatever the house we live in they see us for who we are as a being and that's so rare in life we so many people see us through our credentials or our outward personality or whatever it is how we show up at work but these animals that are truly gifted in this way will and you could feel it when they look in your eyes they just they see you, you know, we had this one greyhound, she was an older greyhound rescue from, from greyhound racing. And she was older, and we'd take her to the classroom. And she would just look at you, and you would melt. I mean, there's no way you could not melt when this dog just like, and greyhounds, these are sight hounds. So they are very good at sight. You know, in fact, some dogs don't understand what, why is this dog staring at me? Well, because it's a sight hound and they, they really look at you. So Mochi would, her name was Mochi, would just really look at you and melt you. But after about 20 minutes, she was done. You know what I mean? Like, because this was such a profound energy exchange that she was done. And we would say to her handler, you know, go ahead, go home. Cause there's no point in, in having Mochi get overstressed or overtired because they, they run out of steam too. You know what I mean? But, but it's so beautiful when you meet an animal and Lulu has a little bit of that, the dog that we're fostering, she has that ability to look at you and it's like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, something happens when, when you really lock eyes with her and not all dogs want to do that. That's not what all dogs want to do because every dog has a different purpose. And when I do sessions with clients, sometimes clients, I won't talk about it unless they bring it up, but if they want to know what's my dog's purpose and some dogs know, some dogs don't know, but sometimes it's really interesting what we hear, what, what the dogs have planned. And sometimes it's very different from what the human thinks is, is going to be the life with their dog. And they find out it's something very different. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Pure potential, right? Yeah. 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 So, you know, with our, uh, human animal connection students, we we um, help them with this thinking about purpose. And we have three questions that we ask them to think about. And the first question I'll ask you, Michael, so you can be my student here. Uh -oh. Say, so, okay, <laughs> it's easy. It's just a feeling question. If I was living in purpose, how would I feel? Tranquil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. At ease. And that, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, that's it. You know what I mean? It's because, like, and when we're not feeling peaceful and tranquil, and I'm talk, not talking about just a temporary interruption or something, but when we're feeling like sort of like in a life way unpeaceful and untranquil, that's a sign that we're feeling separated from our purpose, that we need to get reconnected with our purpose. Because when we are feeling connected to our purpose, there's a certain mm -hmm. tranquility that's priceless. It's beyond going to get a massage or something that's temporary. You know, it, it, it's really just like this feeling of, okay, I'm on track. I'm on, I'm on track with my purpose. It has a certain quality of feeling. And we often are longing for that feeling because we're often not feeling it. We're not feeling that we're on track with our purpose. And it, that kind of underlying malaise or that irritation that we feel when we're, you know, having to give our time to something that we don't really feel is about our purpose and it can be very frustrating. If you're frustrated, it's a good sign because it means that your purpose is calling. <laughs> you know, there's something that's saying to you, hey, there's something else for you and this may not be it. So so that's our first question. If, if I was living in purpose, how would I feel? And then the next question we ask is, which of my actions lead to feeling more of the experience of living in purpose? So now we're thinking in terms of action. So what actions lead you to feel like you're living more in purpose? When I start to um, feel overwhelmed, I realize that I'm doing too much mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that I need to slow down because mm -hmm. um, I get caught up in whatever else is going on and then I start to miss things. Yeah. Um, so I guess the biggest thing for me is to slow down and then I can feel back into whatever's going on. Okay. So that's, that's a, you know, a great tip. I mean, part of what we're doing is we're creating an owner's manual to working with our life, perfecting the relationship with our purpose. I'm not saying that it's ever perfect, but it's like what gets us more on track and what gets us more off track. So just noticing that when you get too sped up or too busy that, and that happens to all of us, but you know, that that leads to a feeling of not being tranquil, not being peaceful, not feeling connected to what your purpose is. And then it can be, get real easy to get sucked into someone else's agenda about what has to be done right now or whatever, because we're, we're off track with our own purpose. And so everybody else's emergencies and goals and visions take over if we don't have our own. So that's really important to do. And then the third question we ask people is, what is one small step that you could take that would lead you to the direction, you know, it puts you back in alignment with your purpose. To stop and step back, take mm -hmm. one step back and change mm -hmm. my perspective on whatever it is. Because if, if it's right here, maybe I can't see it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. if, I, if I step yeah. back, I can realize, oh, I, I really, really need to go over here, but I couldn't, I couldn't see that before. Yeah, exactly. You know, it just gives you a sense of perspective. And I think what's important about purpose is that we not turn purpose into some kind of big bully in the sky. You know what I mean? Like it's not something that we want to torture ourselves with. In fact, there was one person, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but he he basically said, stop trying to find your purpose because that puts you in chase mode, you know, where you're always like looking and it's assuming that you're not in purpose or on purpose. Yeah, right. It's like, oh, you know, are you my mother? Are you my purpose? You know, or, you know, like, you know, you get into this, like, is it this? Is it that? Okay, maybe it's this. And the next shiny object seems like it's it, you know, or something. And so he's basically saying that you want to cultivate your purpose. You want to, mm -hmm. so this is the way where you say, you know, what is that one small step that leads me to that feeling of tranquility, of being on track with my life, being in sync with my life, instead of, you know, being congruent with my life rather than being out of step or out of sync with my life. And so that I like the gentleness of that is that it, it helps us to think, think more about letting our purpose emerge rather than chase it. So I think that's, that's a good perspective. And it's just fun to play with that. So maybe we should just go ahead and take a little break and let people just kind of think about that for a moment. Yeah, I'm going to go take a break and think about that. Yeah. Hey, friends. If you like what you're hearing and want to learn more, check out Dr. Joseph's book, The Human-Animal Connection, Deepening Relationships with Animals and Ourselves or visit the website thehumananimalconnection.org to book an online consultation. Thank you for loving animals. Now back to the show. 
Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hey folks, welcome back. I, I'm so excited to continue this conversation because some of the things that you've mentioned, I'm like, I'm like yep, that was me. Yep, that was me. Yep, yeah. that was me. <laughs> oh, me um, too. Yeah. I, I've, I've done so many things and you know, I've, I've chased that shiny object and like, oh, maybe that's for me. Maybe that's for me. And some of the things I really had to go through, but a lot of it was um, not knowing who I was, right? right and that's, right, that's right. one of the lessons we can get from our animals, helping yeah. us calm down, slow down, and realize who we are at our irreducible essence. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean our path won't change. Right. But um, yeah, stop chasing, stop running so hard. Yeah. I mean, there were so, so many times in my life that I thought, okay, this is my purpose, you know, and I would drive hard as hard as I could and movie business and all this other stuff. And it, 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 I couldn't imagine life without being in the movie business. You know, I couldn't imagine life without living in New York City in Manhattan, which is where I lived. I, and then all of a sudden I didn't. I lived in Hawaii and it was like, I mean, I was still in the movie business in Hawaii, but after a time it was like, movie business? Why? <laughs> you know, you know, it's just like, it was like, it just ran its course. You know what I mean? I mean, of course I'm simplifying, but the point being is that I, I had what I thought was my purpose and I chased it really hard and it was good and it was painful and it was all the things that it was. So it's not a mistake. It was part of my growth and development and all of that. But now I, I feel like I have a much better sense. And it, but even with the animals, I wasn't sure for years. I was like, I know it's animals. I just don't know what it is with animals. I, I know I love them. I know I want to help them, but I don't know what I, I don't know how, how can I make a living? It was, it's not easy. It's not easy, but I have to say that it is easier. And that's the thing that I want to say about purpose is that it's not a final destination. It's not like, you know, you get your Harvard degree and it's done. It's like, you're going to be in this process your entire lives. I'll say it in plural. It's a process of being moving, orienting more towards purpose or what is meaningful or true for you and away from what is superficial and not true for you. And that doesn't mean that we won't take wrong turns or sidetracks or we'll veer from the path. All that's going to happen because that's the human experience. But when we see ourselves veering too far, we need to do a course correction. And that course correction is one of those three questions. It's, if I was living my purpose, how would I feel? Which of my actions lead to feeling more the experience of living in purpose? And what is one small step I could take that leads me back towards my purpose? And then it's not, it's it's a huge question. If you're starting from zero sense of purpose, you can't get from zero to 100. You got to get from zero to one. So zero to one in my case was I love animals. Zero to two was I want to help animals. Zero to three was, you know, I have all these different methods. And then it became a process of, okay, so now how do I get these methods? How do I communicate them? Do I do a podcast? Do I write a book? Do I teach classes? Do I work volunteer at the shelter? You know, and I'm not saying I'm there yet, like in terms of a total final answer, but I feel like I'm more there. And recently, out out of the blue, like totally not expected. I realized that my clients keep saying to me, what should I feed my dogs? And I would look at what they're feeding their dogs. I'd read the packages and it was horrible. And I realized I needed a better answer. So now I'm like really in this whole learning process of discovering what it means to cook wholesome meals for your dogs. And I have to tell you, I am not a I am a stranger to the kitchen. It's like, oh yeah, that's where you open the refrigerator and open the microwave. I mean, that's, you know what I mean? I mean, I am not a chef. <laughs> My ex was a chef. I learned nothing <laughs> because he had no patience. <laughs> he was like, well, earlier in our relationship, I tried to make rice and I, I forget, I must've burned it or something. And he went into this tantrum, you have to be present to make rice. And I said, I am not going to be present in this kitchen. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, I didn't learn. And, uh, you know, now I have to learn. And it's like, everybody's told me all my life, oh, you should eat better, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. But I couldn't, I just didn't have it in me. But now I care about the dogs. I've got an older dog. I've got a traumatized dog that we're fostering. It makes a difference what you put in their mouth in terms of their behavior, in terms of their health. So all of a sudden, I'm like, they have this whole new track that I'm like learning about and going to be writing a book about and helping other people because there's so much in processed commercialized dog food that is just not good for them and 
to help them get back to their being their true selves, we need to feed them better, better ingredients. So anyway, the point being is that sometimes that was a real curveball. I mean, if you said to me a year ago, you're going to be focused on on making wholesome home cooked meals for dogs, I would have said, oh, no, not me. <laughs> I don't even know how to make a home cooked meal for myself. <laughs> but you know what I'm finding is that what I make for the dogs is perfectly edible for me, too, because I'm using human ingredients. And maybe I'll put a little condiment in it or add some bread or something, you know, but fundamentally, it's the same food. I mean, they need these healthy proteins and they need some spinach and they need some yams. You know, this is stuff we can all eat. So anyway, the point being is that sometimes you think you know what your purpose is and then you find out, oh, it's different. So that is okay. That is okay. That's not doing it wrong. That's life. That's being human. But what we want to do is orient our compass. We want to, you know, have those three questions, maybe on a post-it note or something, or just once a day, ask one, or once a week, ask one of those questions. You know, how if I was living in purpose, how would I feel? You know, that, that feeling that you had with just asking that question, it creates a space for you to have a sense of what purpose feels like because purpose feels meaningful and purpose feels connected and purpose feels peaceful and pe purpose feels pleasurable it may not be always joyous like wild joy but it's 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 a delight it's kind of good feeling that all is right with the world you know that saying it it's all good well that's where when you're in purpose that's true when you have a terrible job or terrible relationship or something, it's not all good. It isn't. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So that statement, it's all good, is true when you're on purpose, but it's not true when you're off purpose and when you're struggling. So yeah, it's just something to some, it's, it's, it, I think what we want to do is think of purpose as a GPS system. You're not going to have your GPS system on all the time. It would drive you crazy if it's always telling you which way to go. But every once in a while, you need to know where you're going and you put on that GPS and it gets you where you need to go. So it's the same thing as developing our personal GPS system or what I call, you know, orienting to your North Star is what is it that causes me to feel tranquil? What is it that causes me to slow down? What is it that causes me to not let other people's agenda or shiny objects pull my energy, pull me away from my path? And that really is how we can have a really beautiful and balanced life. And that's what the animals do. And that's what they want for us. And that's what they want for themselves. What specifically are the animals trying to teach us? So I think what they want from us is for us to be ourselves. And when we get out of the human doing and into the human being and being ourselves, then we are orienting towards our purpose. The purpose will find you. Do you know what I mean? Like, like all of a sudden this home cooked meal thing, it's like, I wasn't looking for it. I didn't think I could do it or understood it or, but I'm learning. And so by being open to it, by just caring about, I want to understand why Lulu is so scared this dog that we're fostering, you know, why is it that when a truck goes by, she has to go into her Godzilla routine? You know, what is it? And what might it be in terms of what is she missing on a nutrient level that could support her feeling of safety? Because she clearly has a sense of safety now with us and in the house. And, and, but it's like, why is it so deeply disrupted by something coming by and maybe I need to give her a stronger foundation on the nutritional level so that she can support her well-being. Like right now, when we meditate, when it's time to meditate, we, we'll just say you want to do some energy work now and boom, she goes and sits on the couch in her spot ready and she's out. She's just in her in her peaceful mode. And, you know, I mean, like, so she's clearly experiencing some peace, but there's a level that hasn't been changing enough. I mean, it's all, it's been about two months of fostering, I think, or maybe a little less. But anyway, it's, you know, like I have to like find out what else it is that could really help her because all, although all my energy and healing techniques have worked wonders, there is um, still more to do. And this is where I'm, so I wasn't motivated to discover how to eat healthy for myself in spite of every doctor telling me I should and every friend telling me I should <laughs> never did anything I'd do it for a week I mean yeah this is good but I'm not I don't have the patience you know but but I need to do it for her and so this is being true to that in myself my desire to help her is what's going to help not only me but her but others who are going to read this book someday if I get it done <laughs> working on it <laughs> I, I teach around some of these things as well how 
how do you get back to actually remembering who you are and finding that place? And mm-hmm. I think, I, you know, I, I know the dogs can help us get there. Yeah, well, they are still connected to their na- their nature, that essential part of themselves. Unless they've been terribly traumatized, then they need to get reconnected. But dogs um, who haven't been, or, and when I say dogs, I mean all animals, horses, birds, cats, you know, they, they are themselves. And that's what they show us is, you know, the dog doesn't want to be a parrot. The parrot doesn't want to be an elephant. The giraffe doesn't want to be a mouse. They're all very happy in their current experience. And maybe they'll choose a different experience next lifetime, but they are not struggling against who they are. And that's the lesson for us too, is we are who we are. And now that doesn't mean we're not growing and changing and we can have the desire to grow and change, but it has to start from a fundamental love and appreciation for who we are right now. This is us. This is me. This is me. Not perfect, but I don't know. Maybe some people would say we're perfect. I I, I don't find that very helpful to say, you know, I'm perfect because we we are growing and evolving beings and we just have to grow from a certain self-acceptance, not from a should, not from a I'm broken, I have to fix myself perspective, but just from a point of view of I recognize that there are parts of me that are afraid or tense or scared or whatever it is or angry or they're there. So those are parts of me that are still growing and need to experience deeper levels of safety and trust no matter what other people are doing or not doing. I love that. Yeah, acceptance is such such an important part, and I think we have such a hard time actually doing it. We want right. to, we want to think that oh, I, I've accepted that. Yeah, uh, not completely. Yeah. You know, we might have accepted it intellectually, you know, but we haven't accepted it in our in our emotions, in our heart, in our cells, in our gut. One of the things I'm learning about some of the vitamins is that when the vitamins are def- are deficient, dog's behavior gets bad. That's one of the things why I'm looking with Lulu is that, you know, as much as I can give her healing and we can get her calm and she is calm and she is beautiful, but there is a part of her that can get very triggered very deeply, very quickly, very, very strongly. And there's, you can't talk to her when she's at that 10 level. She can't hear you say, when you say, you can say, sit all you want, she's not going to hear it. And that's because her brain is just hijacked in that moment with the cascade of stress chemistry. So um, I'm hoping to, discover how to help. I'm not saying that diet is going to cure everything. You know, I think it, I think that's one of the things that I'm learning is that you need to work on all levels. You need to work at the physical level. You need to work at a spiritual level. You need to work at the emotional level, you know, the energetic level. So it's putting it all together that really makes the difference. So that's, I, I just want to finish with a story about Ralph. Because um, Ralph was a, a, a former racehorse. He had won some races and he was uh, originally sold for $65,000 and went lame and ended up in this one kind of so-called therapy do- uh, horse place. And I don't think they were doing great therapy, but anyway, um, he was so bad. So his behavior was so bad that they ended up giving him away, you know, the $65,000 horse they gave him to a woman. And uh, the minute I met him, I just felt like, this because there are some horses they are therapy horses and you it was i could see it immediately i hugged him i held him it was beautiful i just was like this love fest and he is destined to be a therapy horse and now he's in a good place he's in a good he's in a good sanctuary that does therapy horse work and he can be himself now for the first time in his life, but he had to go through racing and being misunderstood and being mistreated by everybody and not trusting humans and all of the things that go on in a horse that doesn't fit somebody's mold. You know, it's broken horse, right? Broken horse, can't race, can't ride him. He still can't be ridden, but he's so beautiful and he's so wonderful. And he's a great communicator. You can talk to him just like we're talking now. And sometimes it'd be really funny. I'd be doing a session with one person like away from him in, in my house. And and he'd come in and talk to me during the session and say, oh, you know, she just needs to think about, you know, he would just come in and give me something that I hadn't thought of. You know, it was just really sweet. I mean, he's just so extraordinary a person he'd never met. And he would just come help them. I had a client who's dealing with cancer and he would just come and help her. He would just come and offer her some feeling of love and support and give her some courage. So (laughs) amazing. 
Yeah. So that's a little bit about purpose and animals on purpose and human animals on purpose. And in our next episode, I believe we're going to talk about the power of names because that's a really important thing. It's, it's, you should never name an animal without really making sure that the name is in sync energetically with their essence. So uh, lots of times in shelters, when like in my shelter, they get 75 to 100 dogs a day in and names are just slapped on, you know, by somebody who's very, very busy and they don't mean any harm. But um, I noticed that dogs with the wrong names, meaning the name that's not really who they are, take longer to get adopted. Mm -hmm. So we'll be talking about the power of names in our next episode. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Michael. Thank you so much. I love this. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Bye for now. Thank you for tuning in to The Human-Animal Connection Show. Please visit our website, thehumananimalconnection.org. There you can sign up for our free email newsletter, book a consultation, or check out our blogs and resources. Our best-selling book, The Human-Animal Connection, is available on Amazon. And your donation of any amount keeps our nonprofit organization providing life-changing services. You can reach Michael Overly, author of Let Your Dog Lead, Musings on How to Create an Exceptional Life, on his website at dogsandmen.com or email michael at dogsandmen.com. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.